I'm really excited to be presenting for everyone. Hey, everybody. Uh, I don't know how many of you know me or have watched the YouTube channel, uh, listened to the podcast or any of that, but I've been teaching the LSAT for about 15 years now, and I really never thought I'd be doing this. Um, I started off back in 2005. I was studying for the LSAT, and I took a diagnostic, cold diagnostic, scored in the low 150s. Took another one, still in the low 150s. And I went to an Ivy League undergrad. I thought I was going to go to a top 14 law school, and that kind of score was just not going to get me there. So I took exam after exam after exam. I kept measuring myself. I made spreadsheets and charts and tried to analyze my weaknesses, but my scores just weren't going up. And I realized later that what I had to do was a couple of things. One was to build the foundation first. The next thing was to deeply review and analyze everything that I had difficulty with and not just the stuff that I got wrong. And I never ended up actually going to law school just because I got so obsessed with this exam. And the strategies that you apply, you've got to understand not only how to apply them, but also why those strategies work. So that's something I really emphasize in my teaching. It's something I continue to explore and learn about. And today I'm going to share you just a little taste of that. And of course, I'll provide you with resources that are free, others that are low cost if you want to go check them out and find out more. But this is not a promotional webinar. I'm just here to share knowledge and you may gather that from my YouTube channel and other stuff. I just put out tons of free stuff. And if you like it, then of course, you're welcome to reach out for, for other resources too. So a couple of things I'll share just to start. One of them is what I call the laser approach to LSAT prep. LASER is an acronym standing for learning accuracy, sections, exams, and review. And it's the framework underlying my LSAT study plans. And I've got free week-by-week -week ones. I've got low-cost day-by-day ones. And I think what's really important about having some kind of plan of attack is that it removes the guesswork regarding what to do because you've got 89 numbered exams. Then you've also got a handful that are unnumbered. And a really common mistake is to simply, okay, say, I'm going to work through them chronologically. If you've got a year or two, maybe you start with exam number one. If you've got six months, maybe you start with exam 30. If you've got three months, maybe you start with exam 60. But if you just work through them chronologically, you're actually burning through really valuable material that could help you later. So I think it's really important that you use some of them for untimed foundational work doing them by type, not as individual sections, not as full-length timed exams. Later, you'll have plenty of time to do individual sections and later full-length exams. So again, the, the framework is laser, learning, accuracy, sections, exams, and review. Learning is the theory. Basically, that could involve reading textbooks, watching videos, covering the basics of the exam. What's an ordering game? What's a grouping game? What are strengthened and weakened logical reasoning questions? How do you approach a reading comp passage? Just knowing, getting the lay of the land. A is accuracy, doing individual questions by type to see common trends, to see the proper perspective from which to view each in practice. So how you might approach a weakened question versus a flaw question, you might have learned the theory. Now it's time to do a couple dozen weakened questions in a row or a couple dozen flaw questions in a row in order to better understand the differences and how to approach each in practice, applying what you learned in the first phase. Then S is for sections, doing timed 35-minute sections, maybe 53 minutes if you have time and a half, 70 minutes if you have double time, but regardless, it's working on pacing, knowing, for example, that logical reasoning is in a general order of difficulty, meaning that you might want to spend less time on the earlier questions, more time on the later questions, and that's okay. But getting a general sense of the rhythm through, with which you want to go through a section. Then you've got E for exams and endurance. That's doing full-length, five-section timed exams. For that's for the regular in-person LSAT, for those of you taking the flex, it's only three sections, not five, meaning that taking a full-length exam is not nearly as taxing and endurance is not as important, but you still want to be thinking about things like properly simulating test day conditions. So if that's at home under quarantine during COVID and you're taking the flex, do you have a good internet connection? Do you have a good device? Have you checked out your system on ProctorU to make sure that everything is going to go well for you on test day? Can you establish a quiet home clean environment where 
your roommate, significant other, family are not going to get in the way. How, do you have your background cleared out? If you have like an LSAT cheat sheet taped to the wall or a poster with logic puzzles on it, I don't know if you do maybe, or not, maybe that's just me. You want to remove that so they don't think that you're cheating. So that's just a couple of things to be thinking about. And then for the in-person five section exam, you've got endurance. You've also got what can you bring to the test? What can't you bring? How do you deal with distractions like proctors walking around or other test takers? Obviously, again, during COVID, tough to simulate that depending on where you live. You might be open. You might be not be open. You may not be able to go to a cafe or a library in person. But if you think that might be happening down the line, maybe you want to at least take uh, your practice tests in a, an environment like your living room where other people may be walking around and getting in your way. And maybe that's a good thing to help you deal with the distractions. And finally, R is for review. And by the way, I'll get more into LSAT Flex in just a little bit. Uh, R is for review. And R is, review is, could involve a couple of different factors depending on which section you're dealing with. I'm going to speak generally about logical reasoning and reading comp for now, and then I'll circle back to games since I know that you've been working on the logic puzzles recently. So for reasoning and reading comp, I recommend what I call the Socratic review method. And the Socratic review method is a way to deeply analyze everything that gives you trouble. And I call it Socratic because it involves a series of questions that you're asking yourself to get down to the root of a problem, to understand why, that, why you personally got a question wrong, what specifically gave you difficulty about it. So let's say in logical reasoning, you've got the stimulus, the question stem, and the answer choices. If the stimulus gave, it, gave you trouble, what about the stimulus was difficult? Did it involve conditional statements? Did they fail to use indicator words for either evidence and conclusion or sufficient necessary? Did they bury the conclusion in the middle of the stimulus? Did they use annoying words like accept, unless, until, or without that are not neatly sufficient or necessary indicators but require uh, some additional manipulation to make them conditional? Did you have to link together multiple conditional statements? Was the conclusion buried in the middle of the stimulus? Did they include counter premises or filler? So you see, there's lots of ways they can increase the difficulty level of a stimulus. And now I haven't even gotten to the answer choices yet. So if you're having trouble with logical reasoning, you can see why. There's like 10, diff diff 10 different difficult things they can do. And a level five question may involve all of those. A level one question may involve none of them. And that one could be a gimme for most people. But you got to consider that they're aiming to separate people all along the spectrum from 120 to 180. So there are certain questions that may only have one trick, and that's a level one, meant to separate those in the 120s from those in the 130s. There may be questions that involve five of these, and that's meant to separate someone in the 150s from someone in the 160s. And so when you're doing your own review process, you want to actually write out, you want to articulate or talk with a friend or a coach or a tutor, a study buddy, a professor, and ask them and talk out with them each of these traps or tricks and figure out which ones did you catch, which ones did you spot, and which ones are you uniquely prone to falling for so that you can resolve it and avoid making the same mistake again. Because these things do repeat themselves. And it's really nice, actually, that you have more exams available to you than anybody ever in history. In the year 2020, you've got 89 numbered exams, again, a handful that are unnumbered. And if you even only studied 10 of these in excruciating detail, that would really be enough. You know, I talked with a guy, I became friends with this guy who used to write actual LSAT questions. And he talks, he talks like an LSAT question. It's really remarkable. And so you could see in discussing with him that he thinks about these tricks to include and you know, they, they take a certain pleasure in it, but I, I can respect it actually, because although it's not nice to be on the receiving end of that, if you can spot those tricks and traps and you can even get to the point where you could maybe even make your own little mini drill exhibiting just one or two of these things and see it from their perspective better, you, you can understand why some people might confidently pick the wrong answer and others might just be scratching their head. And there's lots of ways to play around with it, but that's the job of this exam. So that's the stimulus. Then the question stem, obviously there are some classic wordings. They might use certain keywords. If they say strengthen, then it's somewhat likely it's a strengthening question. Other times it may be a most strongly supported question, which is more of an inference typically. And so properly recognizing and distinguishing question stems is really important. And in newer exams, they've gotten more clever in referring to common LSAT question types in uncommon or unfamiliar ways. And so recognizing 
what's a synonymous word or phrase to reflect or, or to represent a classic question type is really important. So did you misunderstand the question type or did you simply not know how to approach it? But there's truly nothing really new under the sun. So if you can relate it back, that'll be useful for you. And finally, you have the answer choices. And on the LSAT, especially in reading comp, they're really good at making the right answer seem unappealing. So it'll, it'll look like none of the five are right in many cases. And you're really looking for the best of the worst, especially in reading comp. Another thing to consider is that they're asking you which one most strengthens or most weakens. And so it's not looking to necessarily guarantee or destroy the argument 100%. It's important to know the proper way to go about this. Again, I went back to question seven for a moment. In the answer choices though, what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that made you pick it? and what ultimately makes it wrong, and what was discouraging about the right answer choice that pushed you away from it, and what ultimately makes it correct. You want to do this again and again and again, and this is really something, again, to be writing out. You could keep a mistake log, mistake log or a mistake journal, a wrong answer journal, where you actually keep a log of all of these things, and you, obviously, it's really time-consuming to do this for every question that gives you trouble, but it's actually worth it. I was talking with a student the other day who was complaining that it was taking her five, six hours to review one exam. And she was like posing this as a big problem. She was like, is, is this worth it? And I said to her, well, are you getting value out of what you're doing? And she said, yes. So I said, then, then keep doing it. And if that means that you're not going to get through as many full-length exams or as many timed sections, so be it. I'd rather that you do half the number of exams and spend double the time reviewing. That's really where the growth comes from and where the value comes from. And I, I actually have a class I taught, I'm gonna pull up the link for you here, where I went through question review strategies in depth. And I'm, this is on the YouTube channel. This is, it's, about, it's nearly an hour long and I go in depth on the review process more if you want to access that. Although I'll make a recording of this session available to you as well if you'd like to review anything later. So, so don't feel like you have to be getting everything down and taking all the notes now. You could just let this kind of soak in and then we'll then ch catch up on that later. But that's really the review process. And I know um, Alyssa was asking me about how to get faster. This is it. This is how you get faster. You get, you get faster by understanding the problems better. You, we could talk about pacing and you know how to flag questions and what to skip, what, come, what could, you could come back to later. And I'll get into that. But really just understanding the problems on a deeper level is really the best way to do this. Now, some tactical things on how to get faster. I'll go through games, reasoning, and reading comp in particular, then I'll get into the flex. So for logic games, the puzzles, two, two big things. One is the order of approach, the order in which you approach the questions within a game. I'm not going to talk about approaching the four games in a section because I think they're in a, a broadly general order of difficulty. The fourth game will typically not be the easiest. The first game will not typically be the hardest. And I think that it's worth just simply doing them the order given. If you want 160 plus, you're probably going to, want, going to want to do all four games. Others may differ with me on that. That's just my personal opinion on this. And that's because games is really the most perfectible section. It may not seem that way. It may be really discouraging at times and maybe unfamiliar, but the typical 170 score is getting perfect or maybe minus one on games and getting about three wrong on each of the other sections. So you're going to typically want to do all four games, assuming you want 160 plus. If, you, if you're okay with 150s or below, then maybe you're going to want to do only three games and really aim to perfect those three. But I'm just going to say, do the, attend to the four games in the order given. That's typically what I recommend. Within a game, though, you'll have about five or six questions associated with that setup and those rules. And you don't need to do the, the questions in the order given you can skip around and do them in the order that works for you. So I would say do the orientation question first, the question that basically tests your understanding of the basic rules of the game. So do, those, do that question first, then do any local if questions where they're saying, if X is on three, then what happens? Make a new diagram where X is on three, unless you have a really comprehensive main diagram with multiple templates or something. Do draw that local hypothetical. And then later, when you do the global questions, the general ones saying which one of the following must be true or which one of the following could be true, you can refer back to those previous hypothetical scenarios. And the, they'll help you eliminate choices. They may even give you the answer altogether along with the scenario from the orientation questions. So 
the order of approach feeds into reusing previous work, previous hypotheticals, and that allows you to work more efficiently. So if you're doing games and you're just doing questions in the order given, or you're not reusing previous work or both, there are some efficiency gains to be made, even if your accuracy is pretty high. If you're brute forcing the game and drawing tons of hypotheticals, that's not really going to let you solve it as quickly as possible. And as you know, speed is really important on this exam, not just solving things in the time, not just solving things accurately overall. And by the way, feel free to ask questions in the chat and I'll, I'll work them in or address them later depending on where I can fit them in. But logical reasoning, order of approach there too. Logical reasoning is in a general order of difficulty and so you can use that to your advantage as well. The first 10 questions are typically going to be much easier than the last 15 or so. So feel comfortable speeding through those early ones. And I'm not saying to go through it blindly without consideration, but most of those first 10 questions are on the easier side. They're not, are there not as many tricks there? So you can trust yourself on those, especially the first five. They're not meant to be throwing you for a loop. If something seems pretty good, it probably is. Whereas on number 20 or 21, there could be something you're missing. And regardless, it's typically worth going through all five choices just to confirm that there wasn't a really tempting trap answer that, that, that played on a, a common misunderstanding. Also, when you're later in the section and you encounter difficult questions, it's okay to skip them and come back, especially on the Flex and the digital LSAT both. The software, there has a flagging tool where you can flag a question, skip it, and come back to it later, and you'll have a bird's eye view of all the questions you flagged. You can easily jump back to whatever you need. And personally, I'll typically flag at least three or four, three or four questions in one logical reasoning section. I'll flag three or four myself. I'll skip them. I'll come back to them later. And that's totally fine. If something seems really time-consuming or difficult for you, you don't need to do it in the moment. And sometimes coming back later will help you break out of previous tunnel vision or it'll help you turn it from wrong to right with that new fresh perspective. So that's really useful too. And finally, again, the Socratic review method really applied heavily to logical reasoning, I think more so than any other section, although in reading comprehension, it certainly applies there as well. And then and by the way, question types I would typically skip in logical reasoning would be parallel reasoning and parallel flaw and principal application. And that's simply because they're the most wordy questions. So they can typically be the most time consuming just because you're reading more, especially parallels where all five choices are on the same topic and have very minor wording differences. Those can really be a time sink. And so since everything's worth the same, I don't see a, a big reason to spend more time on those if you haven't gotten to other stuff that is likely to be easier for you. And then anything, so parallel reasoning, parallel flaw, again, and principal application questions are the ones that I would often want to flag. And of course, if it's a number eight or number nine, I might do it in the moment just because the method of reasoning is likely to be easier. But on a number 20 or number 21 or number 17, it's likely to be tougher. And so personally, I'll want to skip those. And those are typically some of the most hated types. And so that, might, that may apply to you as well. And then anything that's involving really abstract language, like things on philosophy, I would say are going to be a little bit more time consuming for many folks as well, or things like that are on science. And by the way, principal applications, since I see Sydney's asking about this, those are questions where you have a general principle as well as a specific application of that principle, either in the stimulus or the answer choices. And so a general principle might be something like one should always make sure the consequences of an action will be good, not just the intention behind it being good wouldn't be enough. So the consequences are what matters, not just the intention. Then you may have a specific application of that where Bob means to do good, but actually does bad. Therefore, that was not a good action. And maybe Bob should have thought through the consequences first. And then the other choices will mess with that in some way and not fully meet the flow of that general principle. And you, if, I would say, if you want to see what it looks like, just go to any logical reasoning section from recent years, meaning the last five or six years or so, go to the last half of the section and you'll likely come across one or two of those per exam at least. And then let's see, reading comprehension. So how to get faster there? Common mistakes are to spend too much time on your initial read of the passage. If you're spending five minutes on the initial read, taking tons of notes, highlighting and underlining, circling things, then you're not going to have enough time for those specific questions. 
And I recommend max two and a half to three minutes typically for your initial read of the questions, considering that you have typically six or seven questions associated that's already around a minute per question, maybe a little bit less even. And so to spend more than three minutes, you're really eating into your time there. And reading comp is really more process of elimination than any other section. So it takes time to evaluate those choices it's, it's, and it's worth it. So max two and a half, three minutes, obviously it's a place to get to. It may take time. So you may want to start by giving yourself like five minutes on your initial read or maybe 20 minutes on your initial read of or initial passage as a whole plus plus questions and then gradually reduce it a minute or so at a time. So maybe you're aiming to get from 20 minutes down to nine minutes, but I actually misspoke here. I shouldn't have approached it in this way simply because I don't want you timing individual passages just like I wouldn't want you timing individual games. What I really should say is take the section as a whole. So let's say you might, if you want to get to 35 minute sections, Maybe you start with 45 minutes and gradually reduce it 30 seconds or a minute at a time to get to 35 minute sections, considering that not all passages or not all games are of equal difficulty. Some might take 12 minutes on test day and that's fine. Others might take nine minutes on test day. That's fine. And some might take six minutes and that's fantastic. And that's a a place I would love for all of you to get to with the easy ones, but it may not be realistic. But just not again. Know that knowing that not all sections and games, not all passages or games are of equal difficulty. So, another way you get faster with your initial read of the passage is to not take as many notes. I find those who do best on reading comp typically take very few notes or none at all, and that's because it takes time to write things down. It takes time to read things as well, and. On the digital LSAT, you can't even really mark freehand on the passage at all. You're limited to using the highlighting and underlining tools. That's it. So they don't work that well as well, by the way. They're not that precise. And so I wouldn't rely on them. They take, they take time. And highlighting, is it taking notes? Not exactly. I would think of taking notes as really writing something down. So on the paper LSAT, which no longer exists in North America with very few exceptions, you would be writing or highlighting on the, you would be writing by hand now on the passage. Now on the digital flex LSAT, you're writing on scratch paper to the side and you're highlighting using their tool. And that takes time. It takes time to do that. It's a little bit imprecise. You may have experienced some frustration as it's not highlighting exactly what you wanted it to. And it may not actually be the right thing to highlight. You may not know that initially too. And so I think there's, there's a cost there. And I would maybe want you to simply walk away with the main idea, the author's opinion, and note that. That's it, nothing more. And this can really help you to limit yourself to three minutes if you simply aim to read the passage, walk away with the main idea, and then order of approach, solve things in the order that makes the most sense. Meaning you're, t- you're noting the, you're solving the main point question, the primary purpose question, any passage organization questions, author's tone, questions that are general in nature. Then you can do all the specific questions that are detail-oriented, those involving a keyword or key phrase, those that involve line references. And although the published LSATs include line numbering on the, di- on the digital LSAT and the flex, there actually aren't specific numbers associated because you can increase or decrease the text size, which would then mess up all the, all the line reference numbering. So for that reason... They simply highlight it on both the question and the passage so passage you can jump, but they're still detail-oriented in nature. Then finally, I would recommend doing all the general, the inferential questions that require a little bit of reading between the lines, because those are going to be the hardest. I would do those last. And then finally, after those, actually, there's still some crazy difficult logical reasoning style questions involving things like parallel. And I would, of course, save those for last. Now, I see Carly's asking about highlighting. I wouldn't do highlighting period on the digital LSAT. I wouldn't do highlighting. I wouldn't do underlining at all. Whether you choose to do it personally is totally up to you. I recommend reading comp is more personal than any other section. So I'm not going to blanket say, never do this period. It's really about what works for you, but I would test it. I wouldn't just go with your, with your intuition on it. I would actually do a handful of timed sections one way and a handful timed the other way and see what ends up working best for you with, in terms of accuracy and in terms of how you feel about it too, and see what's going to be really be sustainable and do it in the same way you'll do it on test day. So if you know you're taking the flex in July, 
I would do it on a tablet. I would do it on a computer, excuse me, ideally. And then if you're doing it in person, I would do it on a, I would do it on a tablet. And LSAC has not decided on August or exams beyond that yet. Hopefully they will soon. So be ready for anything. The mail sent flex, obviously anything new is going to have some issues. So there were some issues with that, especially with regard to long wait times to start, as well as not all the proctors knowing all the rules. So some of the proctors didn't know that scratch paper was okay, which is obviously a disaster because you really need it for logic games. And it's useful for, for reading comp as well when you can't draw on the passage itself. So for that reason, I would say, don't worry, just because it, although it's been, it was bad for May, it's been better for June, and I'm hopeful that July will be even better. So they resolved a lot of those issues. They got on it pretty quickly, so that at least the next month was a lot better. With regard to the proctor, you seeing the proctor. So you can't see the proctor, although the proctor can see you, which can feel a little, a little weird, obviously. Yeah, I, I hear that. So what I would suggest, actually, and this is, of course, not for everybody, but is a way to deal with it, is to actually practice that. Practice being able to work on something intensively, knowing that you're being watched the whole time. So you could, yeah, it's, it's, I, think it's, I think it's important. So a couple of ways is like, let's say you have a study buddy. You're both st- taking an exam at the exact same time. You said, okay, like Monday at three, we're going to do a practice test. You're on Skype or Zoom together doing that call, watching each other. That at least simulates it a little bit. But the problem is that you can see somebody else, which on test day, you can't. So the next level of this is to find someone who's not studying for the LSAT who can watch you, but they'll turn off their own video. So if you like feel weird scratching your nose or something, you at least get a little over that a little bit in the moment. And then secondly, you could even go next level would be to do a live stream where you actually live stream yourself on social or on YouTube. People will do this for study with me. And it's a way to keep yourself accountable to, so that you're not like, going up, getting up and going to the kitchen to get a drink, or you're not going on social or something, you're going to know that it looks different and you're going to know that you're not doing what you supposed to, we're supposed to be doing or should have been doing. So that's another way to handle it. Obviously not for everybody, but you could also do the live stream and then delete it immediately afterwards. So it doesn't live on. That's a way you could, that's a way you could handle it as well. But it's, I think it's important to get ready for that because there's, it's an, another potential manifestation or trigger for test day anxiety, things of that nature. So I, I would definitely uh, account for that. I think that's, that's an important thing to do. And then um, let's see other questions on the flex. How does, just how does flex work, work? I see Wilson is asking about that. So the procedure is that you're use, you're, it's the exact same format as the regular digital LSAT. So it's going to be the same look and feel. You can see it on LSAC's site, which was previously familiar.lsat.org, the familiarization tool. Now it's L- official LSAT prep or official LSAT prep plus. You can see the interactivity of the exams and how it differs from doing it in a book. So that's what you're working with. You're doing it on a computer. And so you want to make sure that your computer works well and you have a good internet connection. If you have issues with that, contact LSAC ASAP and they'll provide you with a loaner device. And strangely, the loaner devices are actually tablets. And I think that's just because they have them in storage back from when they were doing the LSAT in person. So if you get that, that help from them for the device, it's going to be a tablet. Otherwise, you'll do it at home from a computer. And if your, internet, if your internet's not good, they may give you a credit to take the LSAT as a, at a hotel. They may reimburse you for doing it there where the internet is better. But don't assume your internet's going to be decent. Test it out. And if you're iffy on it, I would just go to the hotel so that you have it guaranteed to be good or at least better guaranteed than doing it at home. So it will, it will look the same in, as the prep plus. It will look and feel pretty much the same. They've replicated the software to be pretty much identical. And so you schedule your exam in advance. You schedule it for, for a particular day and time. It's, the times are available in 20-minute increments from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern time. And so you can book that a few weeks in advance. The scheduling for the July LSAT Flex should open up sometime this week. And then you'll sign on. They'll, you'll wait for a proctor, hopefully not too long. They've largely figured that out. So I think you won't, typically won't have a long wait time. You'll load up. They'll check your system to make sure your system is set up properly with all the security and privacy to prevent cheating and things of that nature. And then they'll scan your room. They'll ask you to, to tilt your camera around to show everything in the room, make sure nobody else is hiding there to give you answers or anything. And then you're, you're ready to go. And you load in. You're, again, you're not seeing them, but they can see you. You can communicate with them over voice, but not video. 
And you can also communicate with them through a text chat. And that's really up to the proctor what they'd prefer to do in terms of how to handle that. And you've got three 35-minute sections, assuming you don't get extra time. One games, one reasoning, one reading comp. You're doing those back-to-back with a minute break between each. And then you're done. And you can do the writing sample as a, as a separate session as a separate session as a, at a later date. So you could do it later that day if you want, or you could do it a week later, a month later. I wouldn't wait that long though, because admissions does want those writing samples and you're doing the writing sample online as well. So that's pretty much the same. And then um, they will email you with the scheduling and you'll get details from LSAC on how to do that. Uh, it'll be probably, I think it's on Proctor Use site for the scheduling. And then you get your results back in about two weeks. So pretty fast, faster than the faster than for the regular LSAT, which was three weeks. And as for how to regain your composure between in between sec- sections, I would say, you know, close your eyes, take a deep breath, and just put your head down if you want, whatever, whatever works for you. But yeah, I would definitely take advantage of, of that time to at least uh, take a break from the stress of being in the moment and try to cool the adrenaline, take a sip of water or something. You are allowed to have water. It's got to be, I think it's got to be in a clear plastic bottle, about 20 ounces, same as for the in-person LSAT. Could be a glass, potentially, I'm not totally sure. A lot of these things are really up to the proctor, especially for the flex, the individual proctor's discretion as to whether they enforce things or not. But if they are not following the rules properly or denying you something that you're supposed to be allowed to have, definitely challenge them on that and ask to show them LSAC's site where the rules are listed so that you can confirm that you are permitted this thing, for example, the five pieces of scratch paper. That's really important, of course. So a follow-up on the flex, everything being weighted equally. So yes, so on the regular LSAT, you have four scored sections, one games, one reasoning, one games, two reasonings, and one reading comp. On the LSAT flex, it's only one of each. So an LSAT has confirmed that all sections, all questions are weighted equally. So logical reasoning has diminished in importance from being about one half to being about one third. And then games and reasoning have increased in relative proportion from 25% to about 33% each. And so how you deal with that is simply maybe spend a little bit less time focusing on reasoning, more time on games and reading comp. But of course, they're all still important. And yeah, each question is worth a little bit more now because there are fewer questions. But on the flip side, you don't have as you you're, you you have a shorter test day, so you're not as likely to get burned out throughout the course of the exam. Endurance matters a little bit less, and also just know that everyone's in the same boat on this in particular. And schools will understand that it was a flex, it was a unique situation, but ultimately, on the flip side of that, the score is what matters at the end of the day. So the LSAT's important of course, but also know that no one particular exam will make or break you. Yes, you can always retake. So there are future opportunities, especially speaking now, if you're aiming for the July LSAT, you still have August, October, November. You could take any of those and still apply this calendar year. And so it won't matter that much. Applying early matters much less than it used to. As fewer people have applied to law school, they're waiting to see who's going to come along, especially during COVID. That may affect things for them as well. So know that you have future chances. And hopefully, if COVID dies down a bit, they may not all be flex. You may be able to take it in person. You may be able to do it with the five sections. So that's good to consider. And as for how to, whether, how to decide whether to retake, this is just my opinion, but I think Many, I think most people should retake, actually. I, I think there's no reason to apply having only taken it once just because schools do not average multiple scores. They only take the highest score. So through luck alone, you could do a few points better. And if you do a few points worse, no big deal because they're taking the highest. So obviously taking it five, six times starts to look a little bit like you're not totally sure what you're doing. But if you take it two, three times, no big deal at all. And schools don't care about flex versus regular. They have confirmed. They have a lot of faith in LSAC to administer the exam properly. They wouldn't be doing the flex if they didn't think they could do it well or that the scores from flex were not just as valid as regular scores. They've they've had many admissions people attest to this. I haven't heard anybody say they don't like the flex or they don't consider it equally. So don't worry too much about that. I would say just take it if you need to take it. And as for which test date I would recommend beyond July, whenever you'll be ready 
So if you want to do it in August, which is six weeks later, approximately, then all you've got to do is stay fresh on the LSAT for another six weeks. That's pretty good. Otherwise, if you go for October, you're in the game for a little bit longer, about 10 weeks or so. But if that gives you more time to get a higher score and you'll have the time to study, then why not do that? It's really just about when you'll be ready. All exam dates are of equal difficulty. No one exam date is better or worse than another. Schools do look at every score, but they only really consider the highest score with very, very, very few exceptions that it's not even worth discussing, really. Like, they look at the highest. They have incentive to consider the highest because that's what goes to the ABA. That's what goes to the U.S. News Rankings, which they all care very much about. And they'll give you scholarship money based on your highest score. So if your highest score is above their median and your lowest is below their median, they're going to say, well... The highest score is what counts for us in our rankings. So we're going to throw scholarship money at you to woo you to attend our school in particular. So it's worth retaking. It definitely is. And take, if you're an upcoming junior and you're going to take the LSAT in the fall, if you're ready by then, great, take it then. Scores are good for five years. And admissions is not really going to care if you took it two years ago versus one year ago, or even four years ago. Again, their incentive is to consider how it impacts them in the rankings. And a four-year-old score matters no less to the rankings than a score from a month ago. So take it when you'll be ready. If you've only got two months before you would take it this fall, I would give it more time. I recommend at least typically five to six months to achieve your fullest potential on the LSAT. So if that means taking it in January, if that means taking it in Next June, if you're busy in the short term, if junior year is a busy year for you, then take it then. A lot of folks will like to take it in August, September, because then you can study a lot over the summer if your summer is pretty free. January is also nice, nice because you have winter break to really give it your all. But if you can also, t- also take a lighter course load one semester and treat the LSAT like a six, six credit class for a part-time job, that could work well for you too. I got a question on LSAT Flex scoring here. So LSAT Flex scoring, and I actually have a, 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 an FAQ I'm going to share with you along with a bunch of other resources. I went in depth on LSAT Flex scoring, and it's, it's hard to communicate math just over, over voice and over video. It's nicer if you have the actual numbers in front of you. So I'm not going to get into all the specifics on this here, but the first link I just put there is an LSAT Flex FAQ where I cover everything LSAT Flex in particular I cover LSAT flex scoring and raw score conversions because LSAC has not actually given any guidance on how to convert an LSAT flex raw score to a scaled score out of 180. And part of the reason is that they consider this a temporary thing and they're very big on statistics and all the psychometrics and the number crunching. And so they don't have any released test forms that are LSAT flex. So they don't want to give a, an incomplete understanding of that. So I've, in the absence of that, I've given a couple of potential estimation to ways to go about this. One simple way would be to take your LSAT flex raw score using three sections and multiply it by four thirds to give you a general score out of 180. It's quite imperfect though. And if you Google different LSAT flex calculators, you'll get a variety of different estimations for the same raw score. So that just shows you that there's nobody really knows. And we're all just giving our best guesses on this. And I hate to say it, but try not to worry too much about it, even though I know you really want to know, just really aim to get the highest accuracy possible. If you have a high GPA, but low LSAT, how would you approach the admissions process? Well, first thing is I would say, retake the LSAT to get a higher score. That's going to be the biggest impact you can make in your application. That aside, obviously, personal statement, letters of rec, all of those matter. All of those can help. So really just give it your all. And that's the case for you, regardless of where you're at. If you had a low GPA, I would say the exact same thing, especially because your GPA is somewhat fixed by this point already, especially if you're entering junior year, you've only got two years behind you. You could still make a big impact, but if you're a senior now, there's not going to be quite as much you can do. That's just the reality of it. Maybe you want to take some more credits, or maybe you want to extend undergrad a little bit longer to give you yourself more time to boost the GPA, but there's obviously big costs to that, especially relative to the LSAT, which many would argue, myself included, actually outweighs your GPA in the admissions process. And so you could have a massive impact on that just by getting a higher score. That's the biggest thing you, you could do. But that aside, 
request letters of rec now if you're applying this fall to give people time to write those for you. Get your personal statement as shining as possible and give it multiple revisions and edits and all of that. I would say overall LSAT, wait, and this is very in a very imperfect estimation, I would say maybe LSAT is half, GPA is 30%, everything else, all the soft factors are 20%. That's one rough idea of how at least I think about their relative importance in the admissions process. Others might challenge me on that. Nobody really knows. Some of this is just a human evaluation process where somebody's personal statement is great. They might give it a lot more weight because they really want this person. You get attached to certain applicants and you want to admit them no matter what. But in other cases, they say this person's LSAT is just too low. We can't make it work. Or if it's super high, they'll say, we'll overlook a personal statement that wasn't perfect. So there's no way to really quantify all of this, but all, the solution is always just to give it your all get the highest numbers possible. So th those are all the questions I see in the chat here. I think, I think I've hit all of them. Do folks have others? Yeah, it does vary a lot between schools. Every school is different. If nothing else, I could share just a couple minutes to go over some free resources I have. All right, so this is my website. This is the LSAT blog, and this is the free stuff tab at the top. I've got tons of free stuff here on every aspect of both LSAT and law school admissions. I've got games, reasoning, reading comp, study plans, test day prep, LSAT diaries with stories from former students who got big score increases, categorizations, and admissions. So this is the LSAT blog. I've also got the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast here, where I have tons of videos on everything LSAT and law school admissions. I've got playlists on games, reasoning, reading comp, test day prep. I've got my best ones compiled in a prep course playlist. I've got over a hundred coaching sessions with actual students where we walk through just their personal needs and I give them advice and do some Q and A. I'll share guidance. I'll, I'll push back on them in certain things. It's a lot of fun. I have recordings of classes like this one. I have a lot on how coronavirus is affecting everything LSAT and admissions. I have a whole playlist devoted to LSAT Flex in particular. I have interviews and discussions with current and former admission officers. I've, I'm releasing tons of stuff every single day. I also have free LSAT Logic Games explanations. So tons of stuff there, more than you could ever watch or listen to, but worth exploring there. You can also search the channel for particular things as well. I've got a podcast where I have many, a lot of the audio from those videos posted and I release new stuff every single day. So you can see I've got tons and tons of stuff here just going on and on, recordings of classes like this, interviews, discussions, and so on. I've also got an Instagram, and surprisingly, people want to learn about the LSAT on Instagram. I post some memes. I also post videos and some text-based stuff too. Lots of stuff there. I'm releasing stuff every single day. I also have the LSAT Unplugged Facebook community where I really create a supportive environment between people. People can ask questions. People can get guidance. I'm sharing stuff too. So tons there. A lot of the same stuff that I'm posting on Instagram there as well. So I'm sharing a lot. I'm constantly sharing more. And I'm also open to requests too for future resources. As for biggest score increases, I mean, I've seen people go from the 140s to the 170s personally. I went from the low 150s to 175 on test day. And I've seen everything in between. So it is possible to improve significantly. Your cold diagnostic does not define you, certainly. And I don't recommend them simply because they are often very discouraging. You know, it's like taking a diagnostic in a foreign language, a language that you haven't even learned yet. Of course, it's not going to go well. You've got to give yourself a chance to learn the material first. So I've been going for a while here. Um, if nothing else, I could, let, I could let you all go, but I could sign off. But it's been a real, real pleasure connecting with all of you, thank you for asking such great questions. Again, I'm including a link here in the chat to a bunch of my free and low-cost stuff. I've also got guides, cheat sheets, checklists, explanations, full video courses for every section of the exam, including live online classes and Q&As and group coaching. It's a lot of fun. They're linked in that link as well if you want to find out more. But again, thanks, everyone, and feel free to reach out if you need anything at all moving forward. Have a good one. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.